I will make a number of shortcuts and hope that uh, you will have the opportunity to download the presentation from the project website to appreciate the details and also the links I have embedded in this presentation. So today I'm going to talk about what is the current European research landscape? How does this tie into European strategic policy goals for research and innovation? How does that lead to FP7 and the continuation of the European research area? And as well in terms of policy, more specifically, what impact will it have on ICT technologies? This is my favorite slide. Uh, you can use it in any presentation you have, basically. However, what it should signify is that we are on the move again. When research has been organized sharply along national borders in the past years, this has been going away. The definition of the European or the creation of a European research area with the ambition to create a kind of common market for research and innovation in Europe is an ambitious goal for Europe, a goal we have to reach, we have to open up European research organizations or research supporting initiatives. I'm not suggesting here that everything needs to be more European. Research is supported at regional level, local level, at national level and at European level. And all these wonderful systems have to find its place and work together to achieve a greater efficiency in our systems. This is not an invention by myself and uh, my big boss, President Barroso, himself has put growth at the center stage of his policy ambitions during his presidency. My commissioner, Ms. Vivian Redding, in charge of information and communication technologies, suggests as well that ICT plays a key role in achieving the Lisbon objectives. And indeed, I'm taking you now through a number of, of slides with figures, which do suggest that ICT is an in important part of our economic life. Now, this project is supported uh, with, by the European Commission. However, there is a large part of support available at national levels and at other European activities. And I just want to show here that actually, from uh, the support to research, it's 56%, which is spent by private enterprises. This is the majority, and we're going to see that this is maybe not enough for the future. 44%, the rest is then public money invested in research. And only 8% of those money is going via Brussels or through agencies which are located in Brussels. So that again, 38%, 36% of the European research is actually spent by national governments and under the control of national governments. And this is good and important that way. However, what one can see is that it's important and imperative that these different funding bodies coordinate the activities in terms of content, procedures and objectives. At the bottom of the slide you will see this famous comparison Europe with the rest of the world. However, it does suggest that uh, the European Union funding and the European research funding is not at the best level or one would hope for. Recently, the UK presidency published a UK R&D scoreboard. There are quite a number of very interesting figures, and I suggest that the interested reader has a look at the scoreboards. What it suggests is that most of the European research is still located with large organizations. So most of the larger companies in the countries spend most of the money on research. And if I take a statistic further on, we see here that uh, among the global actors, the top 500 spenders on European research in industrial environment, we have a number of European companies. They are spending a tremendous amount of money, you see several billions of euros per year, which is much larger than most of the national research programs. However, if we think it through, these programs are going to set the objectives in the various industry sectors. If the large companies, Siemens, Nokia's, Daimler Chrysler are going to invest in certain areas. This should be a direction for all the research ambitions going on in Europe as well. As I have suggested before, the European research in terms of figures is somewhere between the Chinese upcoming investment. And I have put that figure here because I think we haven't seen it so, so often yet. 
it's quite interesting that this proportion of the GDP invested in research is growing quite rapidly in these emerging economies. However, clearly, again, Japan being in lead. What is a bit worrying, however, is the situation that how is the growth about the spending in European research. And while the last few years in economic terms have not been the best one for, various, for the different world economies, the share, invest, the share invested in research is not really increasing, it's rather declining. So you see here as well that the European private investment in research is declining with only about a 1%. However, one would hope for a much bigger increase. We have been talking, or in Brussels many people are talking about the Euron paradox. On the one hand, the strong investment in training, training of researchers and spending in research. However, in the probably not so good turning out of innovation and new technologies. So there seems to be a gap of what, we, what our ambition suggests and what we are actually achieving. And here you see, for example, that Europe is the world's largest turnout of engineering graduates. However, that does not necessarily materialize in the world's largest population of researchers in that area. So there is a gap of retaining people in the field they have been trained for. There are various reasons for doing so, that maybe the flexibility and opportunities the European labor market offers are bigger than otherwhere. However, it is an investment we have taken in, in training people and an investment which is then not so easy to, to recuperate. Japan, which is the green area, you will see that they're turning out a lot of research graduates and are able to translate that clearly into research activities in a much better way than we are able to do. So, I'm, I'm not sure if all of you are aware of the various opportunities which exist at, at, at the European level. And besides the European Framework Programme for Research, which is very popular, large and well communicated, there are a number of other programmes, also part of the European Commission, which also have a pronounced research take up an innovation component, like the regional policy programs. Depending on the areas, most of them have a pronounced ICT component in their program. And I would suggest if you're interested in, in implementation and take up of ICT technologies, that this is one area you have a look as well. Equally, the trans-European networks, which has three parts in terms of energy, transportation, has also one part which is linked to ICT technologies. And it's a great program if you aim for going for cross-border, cross-national implementation of ICT technologies. Beyond that, uh, some of you might be familiar that uh, there's a Eureka mechanism, which is a mechanism to bind together national initiatives into European, or in this case even larger than European initiatives. COST, which is not unsimilar in its ambition to bundle national activities into larger focused European initiatives. The activities of the European Space Agency. You would be surprised that in quite some implementation areas, they have a strong overlap or are next to European Commission activities. And I would suggest that, again, you have a look at how these programs are managed and what opportunities they can have for you. Clearly, coming closer to FP7 and what the future should bring and may hold for us, the influencing factors are the continuation of the establishment of a European research area, again making European research more fluid and more flexible to the benefit of Europe will be influenced by the next financial perspective and you might be aware that, uh, that the presidents and chefs of the countries are discussing right now in December about the next financial perspective and talking about the budgets being made available for research. There are new emerging priorities coming up. Over the last few years security has gained tremendous momentum in the research and implementation area. The enlargement has brought new opportunities for the excellent research capacities of those countries. And that we have economic targets, the Lisbon uh, objective to turn Europe into a better or the most knowledge-based society by 2010. Embedded in this environment, it was the European Commission task to define what could be the new objectives of FP7. And this was done in strong, strong and continuous collaboration with all actors, the member states the constituency, people we work with today, academics at large at universities, with industry, 
very good contacts, either by existing or going to conferences. And with research organizations and industry associations, the European Council as a representation of the member states and the European Parliament over the last 18 months had ample input in the definition of this program, which we have at the, at the proposal stage right now. So again, this is nothing being developed somewhere in a, in a corner. It's right in the limelight at the crossroad of all the various interests of society. So the objectives, therefore, are expressed in a quite uh, societal need to gain a leadership in key fields where we have today a good position already, to stimulate excellence through competition, which is again uh, a hint at the European research area, to develop and strengthen the human capital. Marie Curie support mechanisms which have been used in the past will continue supporting the exchange of European knowledge and researchers and their mobility and to improve the process for research and innovation and allow a higher capacity of turning knowledge into actual innovation. Now what you see here in this slide is the proposed structure of the program. Obviously such a large program running over seven years is going to have a complex mechanism in it. Uh, it consists of four specific programs, which are the one on the left side, cooperation, ideas, people and capacities. Again, these programs are broken down in smaller pieces and I have highlighted areas where ICT technologies play a crucial role. So part of the cooperation in itself is ICT as a priority. However, ACT technologies are so fundamental, so underlying, part of everyday process, that they obviously appear in almost any other part of the program as well. So when you talk about new production technologies, obviously to a large extent you will talk about supply chain technologies, making firms fitter to produce better and faster products. When you talk about environmental aspects, you will have to talk a lot about sensor technologies, which links back to nanotechnologies, new communication technologies. When you talk, talk about transport, transport logistics is today driven by ICD. If you talk about security and space, again, there is a large pronounced component of information and communication technologies in those programs. So again, a, a request to you, depending on the interests and, and the objectives of your research, look beyond the basic core set of activities which are described here in information and communication technologies, go to various areas and see how ICT can support them. In my next few slides I'm going to, to look a bit more carefully into each of those four programs to give a glimpse of what they may hold for us. Before doing so, here I've put up a few figures. Now I have to, to make a caveat here that this is the proposal as proposed by the Commission on the 6th of April 2005. It should give you an indication of, of how budgets would be, would be allocated. Uh, however, the, the figures might and I suppose they will change with the decision of the, of the Council on the next financial perspective. So the proposal suggests a strong emphasis on putting money on the cooperation part, which is the collaborative research in Europe. The ideas, which is uh, the European Research Council, should be funded as well quite strongly, and then you will see the other parts of the program. Now going into more detail on the cooperation program, again we see here the importance ICT plays in today's society and economy, but the fact that it is by far the largest program part of the collaboration program. It will, if possible, receive about 30% of the overall funds allocated to this. And this is a good sign, it's a recognition of the role ICT is playing today. When I go to the ideas program, this is a new, new element. It hasn't been done before. It's about bringing up a European Research Council. It's about creating an organization which su supports frontier research, bottom-up frontier research, uh, supporting individual research teams with their ideas. There's no work program, there's no definition what, what should be in that program. People, brilliant people, suggest what research they would like to do. This will go through a competitive process and then supported by the program. The European Research Council is in the process of being set up. Detailed mechanisms are not yet in place. However, I think everyone is looking forward to this kind of investigator-driven research 
to bring brilliant ideas out and create new innovation. The capacities program is going to look at how is this knowledge and innovation being put at practice. It will support research infrastructure among universities, among other research organizations. It will look at how to make SMEs or how can SMEs better participate in European research and allow them to create more innovation. It allows the regional knowledge centers to connect each other and support innovation. So what you see here is like a complementary program which supports the knowledge creation into the process of innovation creation. One part of that is also international cooperation. European knowledge, European science is very good, however, we have to compete in most of those technologies on a global level. So international collaboration in selected areas and selected technologies is one important part of the program. And the people program. This is a program which supports, it used to have the name Marie Curie, which supports the mobility of researchers in Europe. It's an excellent program to exchange researchers among universities, from universities to private companies, and among private companies. It should create this kind of exchange of knowledge by moving around people, moving knowledge, creating networks, leveraging networks in a better way. This program is going to be big because one billion euro per year is going to move a lot of people in Europe. And I would encourage anyone interested, in particular younger researchers interested in this program to apply and go for opportunities which this program can offer. The international, the international dimension of research, as you might be certainly aware of, is very, very important. Now, the, the approach in bringing about a number of new things is then difficult. Does it mean on the one hand that everything will be thrown overboard and we create new systems? No, clearly one underlying principle which was asked by our political leaders was continuity. No tremendous change in the way the programs operate. There is a lot of knowledge and learning going on on how to collaborate in such programs. This should not be destroyed. So there is a continuity to a certain extent in the thematic areas, in what we do with the European research area, which is a policy objective for more than seven years, for many years. There is a scaling up of the Marie Curie actions, the cautious. The program has been moved to a seven-year duration. The four-year duration proved to be a bit short. Also, the seven years gives the opportunity to link it with the financial perspective and rediscuss it in the framework of these discussions. Now, how is this new program going to come about? Collaborative research, as we know it today in framework program six, is going to stay more or less the same way. So again, the instruments which have been introduced with framework program six, like integrated projects, network of excellence, will be available in the future as well. The European Research Council will be supported by individual projects. So they will make individual contracts with these researchers. The support for training Marie Curie will remain in a similar way as it is today, as well as the support for small and medium uh, and small and medium sized enterprises. However, what is new, and this is what I have put on this slide in red, is that industry has put together a number of European technology platforms. This is a hot subject being discussed 2004, 2005 and in the next few years. We have seen a tremendous interest that by industry to federate their research ambitions and to come up with a European strategy for industrial research in various fields. One new mechanism which is going to be applied is what we call Joint Technology Initiatives, Article 169 of the European Treaty, which allows national programs to come together under a federated scheme to tackle huge technological societal issues jointly. Another mechanism which is uh, now available is the coordination of community programs. And uh, I'm afraid I just see here that I have used the wrong article. So they should be swapped. 169 is the coordination of community programs and 171 is the technology initiatives. However, the one federates national programs and the other one creates long-term organizational structures for tackling research in, in specific areas. I will show you an example at a later stage. So, what, uh, this is a point of reflection. What I have shown you now is a, is a glimpse about how FP7 could look like, what the magnitude, what the subjects are, how it could work.